theyeshiva.net. You got to give the older generation credit that within a few days we all learned Zoom. Not so bad. They say you can't teach a dog, an old do- dog, new tricks. But millions of people learned new tricks since the coronavirus. Even people in their 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s <laughs> learned a lot of new tricks. Okay. Very well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bruchem haboyim to all of the Talmudim. I see we're joined. Can I inhara? I just want to make sure you hear me. Could somebody nod that you hear me? Yeah? You can hear me clearly? Good. Okay. Thank you. So first of all, thank you for the schus and the privilege of being with all of you Talmudim here. Masmidim, Shaikdim, Oivdim, Bnei Teira, Tayyada Bachrim, Yeshiva Bachrim, Teirasam Umnasam, Ashrei Chelkechem, Vegadol Schuschem. How fortunate you are, how lucky you are, how blessed you are that during this challenging Tkufa and era, you don't seize from your Avaidas Hashem, Tmidim Kisidrum, Musafam Kalchasam, to Steig, Michael El Chayel, in your learning, in your Hasmada and Shkida and Teira. And I was asked this evening to speak to you a little bit about uh, my experiences having the schus for a few years being involved in chazering the Rebbe's Fabrengens and then being one of the manich, meaning one of those who are meniach. I don't know if you know where the word meniach comes from, but you learn Mesech the Shabbos, you know, there's an Akira and there's a Hanocha. <laughs> What's the connection of a Hanocha? Where does the word Hanocha come from? I'm not sure I know the answer. I assume the answer is that the Chayzer, the one who was listening to the Rebbe, had to be Meniach. He had to place the ideas into words and make them land and rest on paper. So there was like a Hanocha with ideas which are in your mind and are more lofty, become concretized and they become Munach. <laughs> They become munach, kluta They become placed on a piece of paper with ink, dioy alaksav, as the Lashon is, or in our generation, tfus, oisis atfus, first typewriters, and then, of course, afterwards in the early 1980s when it became computers. So that's the word ahanocha. It's, so to speak, the way the chayzer was meniach, so now it's placed on the ksav. Come in, come in. You can come in. And uh, I guess it also is miram, it also indicates something else. And that is, it's the way he understood it and the way he placed it on paper. Because remember, every mind is different and every mind could be kailat and can absorb things that it can relate to according to its, as the Lashen and Tanya, kefiyi Every neshama, every mind, first of all, has its natural capabilities. It's shayrish neshama, how much it learned, it's kishrayna, so many different uh, variables which come into play. So therefore, it's a hanoche, it's the way the meniach took the ideas that he heard from the Rebbe, and he was meniach it in his signin, in his style, according to his understanding on the on Ksav, in writing. Of course, every maniach, if it was a real maniach, tried to the best of his ability to capture the amitis ha'inyin, the authenticity, Hello? both in terms of toichen and in words, oisius. but nonetheless, every person is a person. A person is limited, a person makes mistakes, shgi is miyavin, and I assume that's part of the expression, Hanocha Meniach, which is not an expression from this generation. It already goes back, I believe, quite a few generations because the concept of Hanocha already started by the Alter Rebbe. I don't know if you know this, but the Alter Rebbe paid, I believe I once read that the Alter Rebbe paid his brother, the Maharil, Rabbi Yehuda Leib, the famous Maharil, who was a gone in his own right to make a Hanocha of every maime that he heard from his brother. And it's incredible that Alter Rebbe did this because because of this, we have today Torah and we have Lakuta Torah 
and we have hundreds, hundreds and hundreds and thousands of my modem of the Alter Rebbe over the years because the Alter Rebbe made sure he understood the power. People, when they hear things, you think it's going to last forever. But the Alter Rebbe understood that if it's not written, it's not going to last. And he, I believe he would pay a salary to his brother, the Madil, to make sure that he's meniach all of the Maimonim that he heard. There were other Manichim, of course. There was the Mittler Rebbe, the Alter Rebbe's son. There was Reb Moshe, the Alter Rebbe's youngest son. There was the Tzemach Tzedek, the Alter Rebbe's grandson. There was the famous Reb Pinchas Reizes, the Alter Rebbe's chassid. Reb Pinchas Reizes, whom I think the Mittler Rebbe called uh, the field marshal, the field marshal of Chassidus Chabad. And uh, we still hear the beeps. We still, I still hear the beeps. So there were others. So you have, you have the Maril, you have the Tzemach you have the Mittler Rebbe, you have Reb Moshe, and you have Reb Pinchas Reizes. That's five. Sometimes you had five Manichim of a Maimer. And then in each generation, you had these Manichim. And, of course, in our generation, in the generation of the Rebbe, there were the Manichim throughout the years. First and foremost was Hagon HaChosid Reb Yoel Khan. Shlita Zalzayin Gezunt, who began right away, Tov Shin Yud, and continued throughout all of the years, throughout Tov Shin and Beis for the next 42 years, all the way to the last Fabrengen, which was Shabbos, Parshas Vayakel, Chof Hei Adir Rishon, Tov Shin Nun Beis. How, do I, how did I get involved in this? So I guess I got involved because of my older brother, he probably spoke at some of one of the sessions, I'm sure, or will speak. Rabbi Simon, Rabbi Simon Jacobson, my, my older brother, the B'chayr in our family, who was one of the group of the Chayzim and one of the Manichim, who started in the late 70s in the Tavshin Lamets. And uh, I guess that's how I got drawn in to the, to the Avedis HaKadosh. Now, <laughs> this is a little interesting tidbit. The, the, way, the way it actually started, was a, it's a cute thing. The ends of the Sikhs were very hard to remember. Why? Because the Rebbe, the, end, the Sikhs themselves had a theme that the Rebbe would develop. Arashi, Arambam, Azoyar, Asiyu Mesechta, Asugya, Aparshas Ashavua, Amaimer. Something about the Shabbos, about the Parsha. It had its structure, its theme, questions, the answers. Sometimes the Rebbe would speak a contemporary union, sometimes about Eretz Yisrael, sometimes about the Avoid of Hafatah Sayyadu, so thank you, spreading Yiddishkeit. Thank you very much. But the, at the end of the Sikha, especially in the later years, the Lamads and the Mems, the Rebbe would say a lot of brachas, usually about Mashiach, but it can go for a few minutes, and the Rebbe would go from bracha to bracha, the Rebbe would quote a posseg from Yeshaya, and a posseg from Yermia, a posseg from Amos, a posseg from Tzvanya, a lashon ha-gemara, a lashon ha-zoyer, a lashon ha-medrash, and the brachas were very hard to remember, that's why you'll see sometimes in Sikhs, at the end of the Sikh, I'll say, chaser ha the end is missing, because the Sikh was so long and so deep, by the time the Rebbe came to the brachas, it was hard to remember. I was a very young boy. I used to stand. The Rebbe would sit, and in front of the Rebbe, there was a shvil. There was a path, which the Rebbe wanted. It should be open, so people should be able to go out. Because in the earlier day, years, when people had to go out for their physical needs, they would have to go on the tables. And the Rebbe felt it was disrespectful to them. And uh, the antithesis of Kavad Abri, so the Rebbe wanted there should be a shvil. At the end, that shvil just filled up with milk boxes because the bacham didn't have where to be. So they just that became such a tight place, such a pushy place, but it was supposed to be. And for many years, it was a shvil. It was pretty open, especially the weekday for Bregma. So people could walk in and out. I mean, not so many people used it, but people used it. So I stood at the end of the shvil. Uh, my brother stood there. I see the Bishal Raskin is here on the video. So he stood on my right when he came from Morocco and he made a hanoche. From Morocco on Hanoche in New York, and he, he became, he became Munach, uh, and some other, some other younger light and Bachrim who stood there. And I happened to stand there, my brother, and he asked me, 
He said, could you remember, I was a little kid, I was very young, could you remember the ends of the sikhs, the brachas, the ends? Could you remember? So fine, why not? So I concentrated, especially at the, end, the ends. And I would chaza them, and he said, and I guess they felt that I did a pretty good job. So when I got a little older, I was drawn in to the Avedis HaKadosh of uh, Chazara and then helping with writing, transcribing the Sichas of Shabbos and of Yom Tif and of the weekdays as well. Another interesting personal experience I'll share with you is I had this chus that every Matzai Shabbos, right after Havdalah, I used to go into the office of WLCC. You know where the office is? I'm sure you guys got a tour of it. If you go to 770 upstairs, you go down the hallway, the end of the hallway, the last door on the left was right near the office of Rabbi Chadakov, Zechreinah Levracha, Chayim Mordechai Isaac Chadakov, the Rebbe's secretary. On the left side is the offices of WLCC where all the hookups would take place and rebroadcast to the world over. So Mitzvah Shabbos, right after Maidiv and Avdallah, I would go in there and I would sit down with, with uh, headsets, with a mic, and uh, my friend Reb and Hackner, Johnny Hackner, Hamachuna Johnny Hackner, would uh, tell me to begin. And I had the privilege of chazening verbally the whole Fabrengen of Shabbos or of Yom Tif. I was very young when it started, and the way it started was as follows. Um, it was Yud Shvat, Tov Shinun. Yud Shvat was, I think, on a Shabbos. Shabbos Parshish boy, Yud Shvat Tov Shinun. 19, 1990, Yud Shvat. Of course, this was the 40th anniversary of the Stalkos Hilul of the Rebbe Rayats and of the Rebbe's Rebbe's, for the Rebbe's Nasiyas. So a huge oilam came in. Our boy Shana, Loinasen Hashem Lechem Leiv Ladas, say Naim Liris as Naim Lishmoya Adayayim Azah. Gemara says in Avoy Dezora Ad our boy Shnin, Loikoy Inish Adayta the Rabbe, Avoy Dezora Dafayam at Beis. It was a big, it was a big, uh, it was a big Isairus. Fabrengen was packed. It was Shabbos packed. It wasn't easy to hear that Ebbe spoke low in those years, lower. I think it was the second Sikh of the Fabrengen that Ebbe asked that since it's our boy Shon, it's 40 years since the Hilul of the Rebbe Rayatz, a new Tkufa. So Tkufa of Koyim Inish Adaita the Rabbe. And the Rebbe asked that every Chosset should build a new Moisid dedicated to Harvatsa Satayra. Harvatsas ha mitzvahs, harvatsas ha yadus, harvatsas ha mayonis. Every chassid should build a moisa dedicated to Torah, avodah, kmilas chassadim in his or her city or community. But everyone, without exception, should build a moisa. This was one of the suggestions, instructions, requests of the Rebbe by that fabreng in honor of forty years. Everybody should get involved and build a new moisa or become part of building a moisa, an institution for Torah for Yiddishkeit for spreading Yiddishkeit, for spreading goodness, v'chuli. I still remember it was Mitzvah Shabbos. I was a yeshiva bocher. I was in Shia learning in Beis Medrash. I think it was Shia Beis of Ahola Torah. My Rosh Hashiva that year was Rabbi Yaakov Moshe Wahlberg Shlita, who was later in Manchester, and I think in Eretz Yisrael, later in Manchester, and then Eretz Yisrael, Kfar Chabad. And I was a pretty young, uh, young boy at the time. How old was I? I was in the area of uh, 16 or 17. The Rebbe finished my Yiddish, Matzai Shabbos. And I don't know, a half an hour later, maybe 20 minutes later, I'm in the hallway. The hallway where the Rebbe would give dollars. It was pretty empty. And I meet one of the Gaboyim of 770, who happened to be a neighbor of mine, my parents' a home on Montgomery Street. His name is Reb Menachem Gelitsky. Menachem Gelitsky was in charge of the Siyume Harambam. Every halacha they finished, they would make a Siyum Harambam. Reb Menachem Gelitsky was in charge of that, the head of Koyal Tefer Eskenim Levi Yitzchak. He sees me and he says, Reb Yosef Yitzchak, you made a new Moisit? I said, Menachem, what's that? I'm not a Moisit builder. He said, you at the Fabregen today, the Rebbe asked that every person should build a new Moisad. What's your Moisad? I said, the Rebbe wasn't talking about Yeshiva Bachar. Yeshiva Bachar, their job is Torosom Umnosom. Onu ein lanu ela Torah. Rabbi Yeshiva Bachar is to zitzen and learn it. 
by Targum by Nacht. Well, I don't know. I don't, I, the Rebbe wasn't with Yeshua. He was talking to people who are involved in Askanis or even in business. They should get involved in a Moisad. What, what it was a 16 or 17 year old Bach and start building Moisadis? What's next? Rebbe Nachim said, Das is Pshetlach. You had the Fabringen. You're now going to say you're not shy to what the Rebbe said? I was buying a Moisad in Taina. I said, what do you want me to do? Go build a yeshiva somewhere? Would you want I should quit learning and go build a yeshiva? He says, no. I want you to start giving chazara, Metzoyah Shabbos, every Metzoyah Shabbos, to everybody around the world who can tune in to, then it was telephone lines, tune in to WRC telephone line. They can hear right after Shabbos a review of the entire Fabrengen of the Rebbe, whether it's Metzoyah Shabbos or it's Metzoyah Yom Tif. I said, Menachem, this is the job that Rabbi Yoyal used to do for many years. I think Rabbi Yoyal would do it Sunday afternoon. And I don't think it's appropriate that I, at such a young age, should do this, should be the official chazara giver of the Fabrengans to everybody around the world, whoever tunes in. He nudged me. He drove me crazy. He said, listen, you all the excuses. If you're not going to do it, nobody's going to do it. It's not done. This is a moiset. It's going to be your mo- <laughs> It's going to be... Yeah. it's going to be your mice that I'm helping you to build it. And he was so insistent. He schlepped me to the door of Yonis and Hackner, Reb Chaim Baruch Halberstam, who was the founder of WCN, of Yonis and Hackner, who was the operator. He knocked on the door. I remember Hackner opens the door, Chaim Baruch, both of them, and he says, Anaya mice We have a new mice Yeah, Yitzhak yeah. Jacobson. He's going to start giving chazona every Mitzvah Shabbos. Before I knew it, I was in a chair with big, with big headphones on both of my ears, on top of my head. And Hackner, uh, all the lights going on with a big announcement and him going like this, one, two, three, go, you're live. And chazona began. And so it continued. It so it continued. There were many communities where Anash, in those communities would stay in shul after Maidav. They wouldn't go home to be able to hear the whole Fabreng, for example, in Montreal, in Miami. And then it would play throughout the week so people could hear it. The next day, Sunday, Monday, it would, the Chazorah would play throughout the week. And this was uh, obviously discontinued. Uh, this was Tav Shinun, so it continued for Tav Shinun Alev, Tav Shinun Beis, until the last Fabreng, which was Vayakel, as I said, Vayakel Tav Shinun Beis. This was another component, which was also a very great privilege, a great, very great schos. And then right after that, Rabbi Yoel would usually give Chazara downstairs in 770. I already had an earlier Chazara, Shabbos afternoon, right after the Fabreng, and so I should be able to do the Chazara right after Shabbos. And then would start the big avoid of transcribing it on paper or typing it on computer, I should say, which was... Very, very challenging. It was very difficult. It was very powerful. It was a great privilege. But I say it was very, very difficult. At least I could speak for myself. It was difficult for many reasons. Most of them, I think, are obvious. And I should tell you, I don't know if I bring you personally, so I'll share this with you. For many, many years, I'm not going to say Ada Yoimazah, but close to Ada Yoimazah. When Metzai Shabbos comes, came, I, I got anxious. And the reason is because those years, Metzai Shabbos, it was such a stressful work. It was so stressful. And I knew the second Shabbos is over. <laughs> That's it. Bo Shabbos, bo menucha, and after Shabbos, there's no menucha. Because Metzai Shabbos, I was usually up all night writing. And very often Sunday and sometimes Sunday night. And sometimes even later. So it was a very, very avoided gdaila. Tremendous, tremendous privilege. Tremendous, tremendous chus, obviously. Extraordinarily rewarding and powerful. But, but very challenging. It took a lot of yegiya, a lot of discipline, a lot of diligence, a lot of work, a lot of time, a lot of kaychas hanefesh. And the most important thing, a lot of concentration, a lot of bittel, and a lot of learning. I'm going to now address a few points about this work and then relate it 
to your work now, to your avoid now. And also, a lot of boys sent in questions. I got around 20 questions from Bachrim. I'm going to address those questions. And some of the questions I'll address in my talk now. And then we'll take questions afterwards as well. You can chat, you can chat here. On the Zoom, there's a chat. You can ask your questions. And believe me, I'll try to answer whatever I can. First of all, I'm going to talk about memorizing. How did we memorize the sikhs? How can you memorize? So the first thing I'll tell you is not easy. <laughs> to memorize a sikh is not easy. Very, very difficult. It takes a lot, a lot, a lot of work. But how? How can one even do it? And the answer to that is, really, I'm not sure I know the answer. That's the honest answer. But for it, I'll say a few points. Obviously, some people have kashrayness. They have skills, resources that Hashem gave them and blessed them. It makes them maybe, you know, every person has their unique kashrayness in the world. Like the Rebbe once said in a fabrengen, <clears throat> no person is a mashpia or a makabal. No balchai is a mashpia or a makabal. No tree is a mashpia or a makabal. Nothing in the world, nothing in our world and our planet is only a giver or a taker because then it would be kinab and maiseberashis. There would be jealousy in my sabbatious. Every single organism and every single piece of matter gives and takes. Everything is part of the cosmic ecosystem, let's call it, of give and take. Everything. The earth receives, but the earth gives. Every animal gets, and it also gives. Every tree gets, and it also gives. So therefore, every person has unique kishrayness that they give, and others other kishrenas that they receive from others. We all are givers and takers, and you have to always figure out what's your tchum. So that's, of course, the first thing that certain people are blessed with certain talents. But there was another major quality that was a prerequisite for Chazara and for Aminiach. And that quality was the ability to really, really be able to listen to the Rebbe. Now, what do I mean listen? I don't only mean listen, that you listen. Listen means, I'll use the Lashon of Chassidus, Hanachas Atzmusay Mamesh. Hanachas Atzmusay Mamesh in simple English means that when you listened, you could not be present. I couldn't even think about the fact that I'm not thinking about anything but the Sikh. Because if you were thinking about anything besides listening to the Rebbe's words, it was already a distraction. What is more, even if I was thinking, Wow, this is a geschmack of art. You know, you hear sometimes something from somebody say, wow, this is awesome. This is gewaldic. This is great. I remember myself, the Rebbe would sometimes ask a question or give an answer. And I had a taiva. I wanted to stop for a moment and kvel in the tainug, wallow in the geschmack, tell myself in my mind, ah, what a beautiful, powerful geschmack of art. But the moment, if I did that, I remember I once did it, it was the worst distraction for Chazada. You know why? Because it means I'm not listening. That's already a tenua. In Lashon Achsidus, it's a tenua of yeshes. It's a tenua of, it's not bittel. It's not me, complete, I'm not completely open. I'm not empty. Clay reikon machzik. Be completely empty. Empty, I don't mean here, an apustakeli, that clay reikon. That clay reikon is not machzik. Here, reikon, I mean... A keli that's completely open. There was nothing in the world but the words, nothing else. Not my thinking about it, not my understanding it, not my processing it. If in the middle of a sikha you stopped to try to process what the Rebbe said, which is very normal, I want to get it. <laughs> you lost it. Now, it happened sometimes, and I knew I lost over there two minutes, and I'm like, oh my God, I lost it. Sometimes you hope that another chayz have filled the gap, not always. So this was on a very important yesoid, to be completely, completely vacant. Koyach ma, the nekuda of chachma, complete, complete vacancy and openness, where the mind is completely suspended from any machshava of self, even of the self experiencing the sicha. There could be absolutely no intellectual assertiveness of self whatsoever, even in the slightest degree. 
You have to be mummish like a wet sponge. That's the reason, by the way, why children have such a powerful ability to absorb information, you know? You remember, you remember, children remember everything. You know why? Because they have bittle. They're completely, completely open. As adults, when we hear something, we don't really listen. We have opinions. Even now, you're listening to me, you have an opinion about what I say. When I listen to somebody, oh, it's good, it's geschmack, it's boring, I heard this already. The moment you had opinions about the sikhs, you're not listening to the sikh. You had to forego the taiva of even the 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 taiva, the chsidish the taiva of, of enjoying it, of experiencing it. No, there's no experience. There's only the Reb talking. There's only Divrei Halaf, nothing else. You sit, you stand completely open. Later, later is already Bina. This is Chachma. Later is Bina, where you can, you have to chazet it and reconstruct it and understand it. This was number one. Number two it was the sense of urgency and history. Imagine you knew that you're sitting at a mountain. And Moshe Rabbeinu comes down and he's giving you over Torah that he's never going to say again. And if you don't listen and you don't tune in, it's going to be lost forever. That feeling of achrayis, of the schus, was the feeling that I had when the Rebbe spoke. We knew this the Rebbe is not going to repeat this again. The revelations of Torah Nigla of Torah, Halacha, Pnimius, Kabbalah, Chsidis, Machshava, all Chalki Torah that the Rebbe is going to reveal now. He's not going to reveal again. That urgency, that sense of purpose, that sense of uh, connection with the godless of the moment, with the history that is taking place right now, really creates a certain intensity and an urgency that allows you to tune in in a way that you wouldn't tune into other things as as important and as beautiful as they are sometimes i can't remember a conversation from yesterday but this was a you knew we knew that this is a special moment it's not going to happen again it's shabbos it's yom Tov, there's no recording there's no tape you're responsible the beginning of chayiv adam loimar bishvili nivra the weekdays was taka very different because the Rebbe was recorded on a tape recorder, on a tape. There used to be such a thing called a tape. You'll ask you in Rosh Hashiva what a tape is, I'll tell you. Of course, this is another major factor. The Rebbe didn't say before what he's going to talk about. He didn't give notes of what he's going to talk about. Sometimes he notified a Rashi he's going to address, but even then, not many details. Sometimes a question, two questions. You knew that I was going to talk about the Parsha. You knew he's going to talk about a Rashi. You knew he's going to talk about a Rambam. It could be a, a heavy sugya in Rambam. You knew he could talk about another sugya, another Indian. You knew he's going to talk an Indian in the Zohar, in his, the, the hardest of his father on Zohar. You knew it may be a Shabbos. He may talk about Perkyavis. It's going to be a Maim Echsidis. You knew, but but the details you never knew. You never knew. And the Rebbe would quote from everywhere and everything. As you know, the Rebbe would quote, of course, Teresh Shabbat Ksav from the whole Tanakh. The Rebbe would quote Teresh Shabbat Peh from Bavli and Yerushalmi and Sifra and Sifri and Tisefta and Medrashim and Zoyar and Mechilta. Of course, Rambam and Rishonim and Achroinim and Poiskim and Sifri Halacha. And of course, all the Svarim of the Alter Rebbe and Rabbi Seinu of Chabad of Chesidus. And Bechlau, Quotes from Svanim of Machshava or Svanim of Halacha. And the Rebbe would quote, and the Rebbe wouldn't always explain every quote and translate. Sometimes it was very bekitzer. So you really, really had to be as much as possible behavent in learning and steeped in learning in the Rebbe's style of learning. So even if I wouldn't know every quote where it's coming from, first of all, you had to try to learn as much as possible so you should be able to absorb as much as you can. But even if not, you had to know the Rebbe's style and mahalach so you could retain information even if you didn't understand it fully. And then later you can go and look up the sources and reconstruct it and understand it. 
Another very important quality in Chazara and Meniach is appreciating the Rebbe's Mahalach HaMachshava to the best of our ability. The Rebbe had a certain derech in learning. Not an easy derech to capture, but the Rebbe had a derech in learning. Just to give one example of that derech, the Rebbe said this out of Shavuos Tavshin Lamed Beis, and he said it other times as well. Whenever the Gemara brings a name of somebody who said something, it's because you have to know the name in order to understand what he said. That's why sometimes the Gemara brings ideas, a memory without a name, just a, a, a statement. It could be from Bnei HaYeshiva. It could just be quoted in Gemara. If it's with a name, it's because the name is relevant to the sugya, to the message. Now, you know what that really means? What that really means? Did ever say this? He spoke about the sugya of... of uh, of Amr Rabbi Yosef, Ilav Hayoyim de Kagarim, Kama Yosef, Ike Bashuk, Psachim Samaches. The Bible said it's Nagir that it's Rabbi Yosef. A whole long sech out of Shvu was Tavshin Lamed Beis, with a Hemshech on Shvu, with a Hemshech on Shabbos Nasse, with a Siyam on Saita. Part of it is printed in the Chelik Yud Gimel. The Rebbe spoke in a lot of Lashitoses of Rabbi Yosef and Shas. But what does this really mean? What this means is that all the Mamari Chazal that come from Rabbi Yosef are all connected. There is a Psashita that Rabbi Yosef has, and if you know his name, you'll understand the ideas much better. So that means you have to know everything Rabbi Yosef said everywhere in Kola Terakul and see the connection. Now, that was the derech of the Rakat Shavar that the Rebbe used to talk about. Now, to, to even start doing this, a person has to have a mastery of the whole title, but it was important to know that the Rebbe thinks in these terms, which the Rebbe used to say that it's very similar to the shit of the Rakat Shavar. We used to quote a Tesefta, that Kola Terakul Inyan Echot, so Machlekes and Tosefta, if a, if a Talmud asks something, Shaloi Ke'inyin, so Reb Meir says he can ask Shaloi Ke'inyin, the whole Torah is one Inyin. And the Rebbe took this very seriously. Because even though the Torah speaks about billions and billions and billions of Inyanim, if you're mafshet it, if you can divest the, the particular story from its external manifestation, and explore its core, its, its seed, the etzim of it, you'll see that a sugya in ribis, and a sugya in muktza, and a sugya in ezikin, and a sugya in taris, and a sugya in kilayim or demai, and a sugya in chagig or in edevin are all connected when you get to the nesham of it, to the pnimius of it. On the other hand, the Rebbe had very much the briske derech, which is really dissecting the suge al-asar, taking it apart, compartmentalizing it, figuring out the pnimius of the suge al-asar. One is the p'chin of soiv of and one is the p'chin of amal of And the Rebbe Mamash always tried to synthesize both, which is the union of atzmus, which synthesizes soiv of amal I hope you know what I'm talking about. And then, of course, there was the Rebbe's idea that every single halacha and mitzvah has a pnimius to it. Every mitzvah, every Allah, every story could be explained in Avoid the Every Rashi is a Yena Shal Tayyid, as the Alter Rebbe said. And the ability to synthesize completely the Nigla and the Pnimius, the Kabbalah and the Halacha, the Chitzainius and the Pnimius, the Guf and the Neshama, and that it's Mamish a Tayyid Achas. It was also, these are, I'm just mentioning a few, I could mention two, three hundred themes, but you had to become completely saturated with the Rebbe's Mahalach HaChaim and Mahalach HaMachshava. And because we had the schuz that the Rebbe spoke a lot over the years, and he wrote a lot of letters, and he edited a lot of sikhs, and he said my modem, and he had kuntus, kuntresim, etc. So it gives and it gave people the ability, to, again, to the best of our ability to be able to tune into this and really try to become Bahavant with the with a cook with the perspective of the Rebbe, how he looks at Yiddishkeit and how he looks at a Jew, and how you learn a Rashi and how you learn a Toisvis and how you learn a Rambam, and how you see a story in Chumash, and how you look at a contemporary situation. Vuchuli Vuchuli. This was another major factor that allowed the Miniach to be able to try to do a successful job in transcribing the sikhs. Now I can tell you from experience and from what I have seen, nobody remembered the sikhs verbatim. It's a myth if somebody tells you that somebody remembered the sikhs word for word. That's not the case, at least not for the years when I was around. Earlier years, I can't tell you, but I don't think anybody remembered the sikhs word for word. 
Some people remembered it exceptionally well, some not. Even if you remembered, there was remembering and there was understanding. Not always was it so easy to understand. The Rebbe could sometimes be Meirich in a question, and another question, another question, and then the answer he said so fast, and you couldn't even grasp it. It was sometimes very, very difficult to get. Rabbi El once said that the Rebbe's mind was so fast that sometimes the Rebbe, his speaking couldn't catch up to his mind. So the Rebbe's mind was already finished, but the speaking, he didn't get to it yet. And the Rebbe had tremendous, had to tremendously be metzamsim, his ideas in the words. So sometimes the words did not, the Rebbe was thinking and the Rebbe was already ahead of it and the words didn't catch up to it. So the Rebbe didn't finish the subject. And you sometimes came out and it was very difficult to get. And this, I want to tell you another major important idea when your menia chasich is, it's not always so easy to get the sicha. The Rebbe could start off with something, go on to an Indian, ask a question, go off to another Indian. He answers it, but the answer may not be clear. You really have to listen and listen again and listen again, because sometimes there will be one nuanced statement and there you'll chop it. And you could miss it and you didn't get the sicha. I have seen and heard people review sichas. I've seen and people who transcribed sichas. They didn't get it. They got words, but they didn't get the neshama. And here you have to have a cloud. Here's a cloud. The Rebbe said this one summer, I think, that every Fabrengen used to have one nekudah. If you don't see that, you didn't get it. Every sicha has one nekudah. One atzmi is the nekudah that pervades it. There is, there is, there is in, in the Sichas, just like in Torah, there's the goof of the Sicha and there's the Neshama of the Sicha. The goof of the Sicha is what the Rebbe is saying. The Neshama of the Sicha, I'm going to call the energy of the Sicha, the message of the Sicha, the revolution of the Sicha, the game changer of the Sicha, the paradigm shift of the Sicha, the Pnimi is the Kemahalich that the Rebbe is revealing in the Sicha. That is very easy to miss. A lot, a lot of people miss it. I've told Bachram over the years, how do you know when you're learning a sicha that you understood it? How do you know? If you can explain it to somebody else, but I'll tell you one of the ways you know. If you can explain to me afterwards that only the Rebbe could have said that, you understood it. If not, you probably did not understand. Because every sicha has in it the unique stamp, the shtempel, the atzmi, is the non nafshik savis yehovis, the tzaddikim daimel lebayram, the Gemara says in Shabbos, kovdalo da noichi, a non nafshik savis yehovis. Or like the Rebbe said about the Baal Shem Tev, that an atzmi, you, I think, Yudshva Tov Shem Chav, an atzmi, whatever he says has his atzmi. So any Torah from the Baal Shem Tev tells you everything about the Baal Shem Tev. All you have to know from the Baal Shem Tev is one Torah, and you know everything about the Baal Shem Tev. But that Torah, you have to get to the etzim of the Torah, what we call today DNA. You take DNA from somebody's saliva or somebody's uh, hair or somebody's nails, you have everything. You don't need more. One, 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 one genom in one cell out of 50 trillion cells, but you have to get to the DNA level. If you just get to the chitzonius, you don't get the whole picture. And the Rebbe then showed one third of the Baal Shem Tev, it captured all of the Baal Shem Tev. With the Rebbe was the same thing. One third of the Rebbe captures the atzmius of the Rebbe, if you can get the atzmius of that Torah. Sometimes in a sicha, the Rebbe sometimes gets to the punchline, but the punchline he says so fast, that you miss it. And you didn't really get the mohus of the sikh. And this takes a lot, a lot of learning, a lot of training. Most importantly, opening yourself up to the to the to the derech ha of the Rebbe, to the Rebbe's tainug, his rotzen, his seichel, the Rebbe's the Rebbe's way, how he looked at the world, how he looked at Torah how we lift Torah, how we communicate Torah. And it's, it's even hard to describe in words. I mean, I could talk about it a lot, but this is something you have to cultivate. And it takes, this is, not a, this is not a very simple thing to do. There's also something else. This I remember, many sikhs. The Rebbe would go, me inyan, le inyan, le inyan, le inyan. Yeah, I'll give you an example. Yud Shvat Shen Mem. The Rebbe made a siyum, a former sechtas. Brachis Nazar Yevamis Krisis, Banayich. Rabbi Yosheber Salavechik, Zechren and Levracha, was there. It's a famous Fabreng in 30 years, Yutshva Tav Shema. The Rebbe said the Siyam. The Rebbe asked the question. He quoted the Aruch Lenair. 
the Aruch Lener on the on the on the four Masechtas. The Rebbe started to ask questions on the Aruch Lener's Pirush. Why the, these four Masechtas have the seal? Then the Rebbe started to give a whole introduction why one has the right to ask a question on the Aruch Lener. The Aruch Lener was a Gadol B'Yisrael, was a Gaon Olam, was a major Talmud Chacham. Has an extraordinary Pirush and Gemara, and the Rebbe says the Rebbe is questioning himself that he's questioning the Aruch Lener. So the Rebbe went off Kivayachel on a whole tangent explaining why he has to question the Aruch Lener because Torah the main thing is MS. And if you don't understand, Dafman Fregen. If you don't understand, you have to ask. I once saw a Vart, Chaim Velozhner writes, it says in Perkei Avos, Yehi Beis Chabeis Vad Lachachamim, Veheve Mis Abek Bafar Aglem. What's Mis Abek? Mis Abek? So the way the Velt Aja of Mis Abek is from the word Avok, dust, right? That you have to like sit in the dust of their feet. For choice about someone's of them. He types Mis Abek comes from the word Vaye Ovek, a battle. Wrestling match, Miss Abig Bafaragle. You have to be able to fight with them. In other words, a real Talmud has to be able to challenge his Rebbe. In Mifashtetnish, Dafman Fregen, Miss Abig, fight in a good way. But Bafaragle, with a bitl, with a derecher, it's a beautiful taich. This was, this was the toichen in different words that Rebbe was saying then about the Uruch Lene. And then the Rebbe went into the whole Arichis of, of, of Machloikis and Taira. You thought that the Rebbe was just busy explaining. Why he's asking on the Aruch Lene, but really how the Rebbe would do it is, from there he was already going into the Hadron on the Masechtas, but the Rebbe didn't say, I'm going back. Sometimes the Rebbe would say, I'm giving a Maimer HaMuzger. Parentheses. And then he would say, Ad Khan Maimer HaMuzger. But that was unique. Very often the Rebbe would give a Maimer HaMuzger, but from the Maimer HaMuzger he went right back to the whole Sikha, and you sometimes didn't get it. So these are things that you really have to have to notice. Sometimes the Rebbe would put in an an, a part of the answer in the middle of the questions, and you had to really understand that. Sometimes the Rebbe would go from one subject to another subject, and he could cover in one sikh many subjects, and you don't see what's the connection. And at the end, the Rebbe says a line, and if you got that line, you say, ah, wow, that's the connection. These are all missing links where one had to really, really concentrate and tune in to the sikhs to really be able to grasp. Sometimes, of course, the Rebbe, knowing that the Olam didn't understand, we would ask questions after Shabbos. The Rebbe would either answer them, Biksav, or not answer them, or sometimes speak about it the next Shabbos. Sometimes he would go to the next Shabbos, the next Shabbos. There could be sometimes a Fabrengen, a second one, a third one, a fourth one, and sometimes even more where the Rebbe could continue one subject because of the many questions. Sometimes the Rebbe would give very sharp responses to the questions on the Fabrengans. If you didn't think through your questions right, the Rebbe was a, uh, I don't want to say the word tough, I don't think the word is tough, but the Rebbe was a very exacting editor, a demanding editor. He wanted people... (laughs) to live up to very high standards. He did not appreciate laziness. The Rebbe did not appreciate negligence. The Rebbe did not like mistakes. The Rebbe did not like a lack of professionalism. He really didn't like when something was misquoted. He was very upset. And generally, if something was inaccurate, the Rebbe was very, very sensitive to the fact that things mummish have to be on the most, on the, on the, on the most emes, I remember once of Abreng in Chai Elul Mem Zion, the Rebbe spoke about the Rebbe Rashab, that he said that he heard seven toiris from the Baal Shem Tevin And the Rebbe Rayad said it over Tofresh Tzadik Zion. Agav, Derech Agav, the last two toiris are missing. Not because the Rebbe Rayad didn't say them, he said them. But the Rebbe said that the Choyzer, I remember, the Rebbe said the Choyzer, wrote Chaser, Chaser, it's missing. The Rebbe said, the Chaser, the Meniach, wrote Chaser. We don't have the last two Titus. I'm saying from memory, yeah. I have to look it up, but I think it was the last two Titus. And the Rebbe said, it's Bahashgach Pratas. And the Rebbe explained why the last two Titus are missing. Later, somebody told me that the Chaser was Reb Mardechai Mentlik. Mardechai Mentlik was one of the Rosh Hashivas of Tem Chetmimim. 
and he was very ill. He had cancer. He passed away Tishrei Memches after Sukkot. I still remember his last Rosh Hashanah in 770. We used to sit near him. My father, Olav Shalom, had a place near the White Wall and in front of Mizrach, and he sat there, so we sat close to him. But I believe that year, he was so weak, he sat in the back, and I was there, and I remember him davening. So there was a Yesh Reimnim that the Rebbe wanted to speak about him and mention the Choyzer of the Rebbe Rayat, Tafresh, Sadik Zayn, the Mordech It was one of the things they said after the Fabreng, and of course, it's hard for us to know if it's accurate or inaccurate, but this was an interesting thing that the Rebbe said, it's Bashgach Protis, that the Choyzer wrote Chaser, because Lepoel Mamash, it's missing, it's, miss, it's missing in the Sicha. The Rebbe then asked a question. He said, it's Bavuz that in Chabad, they weren't so into Moivsim, wonders. Chabad was more Chachma, Bina, Das, Lernen, Nigla, Lernen, Chsidis, Fashtei, Davene, Avoidis Hamidis, not Moivsim. It wasn't a Chabad thing. Yeah. It was the old word from the Kotzka. Oisus of Moivsim, Ba'admas Bnecha. So the Meniach wrote that. He wrote that. Chabad, they weren't into Moivs. I remember the Rebbe circled and wrote, I'm not saying verbatim because it's from Tov Shemem Zayin. That's Nun Zayin, Samach Zayin. It's 33 years ago, so I'm not saying it verbatim, but more or less. The Rebbe wrote, Im Kain, Mahu, Hashturim, the Kriyas Yamasov. If so, what? Why do we make every day a shturm about Kriyas Yamsu? Chabad is not into Moivsim. Kriyas Yamsu. Hashem split the sea. That's why every day I have to say Oz Yoshir and mention Kriyas Yamsu in Shachris and mention Kriyas Yamsu in Mairiv and Emes Vermun. Chabad not into Moivsim. The Rebbe could not. The Rebbe didn't want such a thing. We're not into Moivsim. The Rebbe said, so why do we celebrate Pesach? What happened on Pesach? So maybe we should start. We should stop. We should stop celebrating Pesach. We should stop celebrating Sukkot. We shouldn't celebrate Hanukkah. We shouldn't celebrate Purim. The Rebbe then fixed it, and he said Chabad wasn't so infatuated only with Moivs. In other words, the Rebbe minimized it. I'll give you another example, an interesting thing, very interesting thing. You can learn a lot from it. There was one one week, one week. Uh, Tovshin Mem Tovshin Mem Zayin, probably Parshas Vayetze Shabbos Vayetze Yud Kislev Tovshin Mem Zayin. It's the end of 1986. The Chag of the Mitzvah Rebbe. So the Rebbe spoke about the difference of the Alter Rebbe and the Mitzvah Rebbe. The Alter Rebbe was Chochmah, the Mitzvah Rebbe was Bin. And remember, the Rebbe said, "Give a cook." You could look at their Maimon and the Alter Rebbe. What he explains in three pages by the Mitzvah Rebbe is 50 pages. A Maimon that goes. The Rebbe said, "Send like a mud." Dozens of pages by the middle of the Rebbe. You look in Torah Shayim, the middle of the Rebbe is my mother. My mother had Murem Tsai. You have a Maimon Torah Ereva Yetzei Vayishlach. It's two pages, three pages, one page, four pages, five pages. And in Torah Shayim, it could be 70 pages. You have to spend a, a good week or month on it. And the Rebbe said, the Alter Rebbe is the Nekuda, and the middle of the Rebbe is the Bin, Archave, his pastors. And he brought a Lashon Hazoyer. You need the Nekuda Beheichale. Heichal is the chamber, the big mansion, and the Kuda is the seminal point, like the beginning of it, the essence of it, like the tippa, the semen of the of the fetus. And then the woman, Ima, Chachma is Abba, and then Bin is Ima, she develops it and turns it into a beautiful baby with limbs and bones and organs. And after nine months, it could come out. The Rebbe said, if you have Chachma without Bina, it's missing because it's not developed. It remains completely abstract and transcendent. But if you have Bina without Chachma, you have the Hispashtus, but you don't have the essence. You, don't, you have to go back to the Nekuda Satamtus after Bina. And the Rebbe was quoting the Maimorim from the Alter Rebbe and the Mittler Rebbe about Chachma and Bina to explain the Maimorim of the Alter Rebbe and the Mittler Rebbe. The Meniach quoted the Maimorim from the original. So he, in one of the Maimorim it says... <coughs> If you have only a nekuda and it doesn't develop into a structure, it's purposeless, it's meaningless, it's valueless. You can't do anything with it. The meniach put that lotion from the maimet into the sikh. The Rebbe wrote, 
I'm not saying it verbatim. I don't remember verbatim. It's 33 years ago. I'm telling you the Taichit. How can a person write such words about the Alter Rebbe? It says, I'm in terms of Chachma, if I have, a, if I have an epiphany, an idea, and I don't develop it, so it's like what's going to happen? It'll get forgotten. You know, you have an idea, a beautiful flash, a, a lightning bolt goes into your mind, goes, goes off in your brain, the aha moment, it's an epiphany, it's a hisgalus, like a borak a maverick, a blitz, suddenly. But if you don't take it and concretize it, write it down, chazit it, think about it, it's going to be forgotten. You're never going to get it back. That's the nakud of the maimer. But the Rebbe said, how sensitive you have to be. If we're talking about the Alta Rebbe in the middle of the I'm talking about an idea that comes into your mind. I'm trying to bring out to you how sensitive and how exact the Rebbe was when words are transcribed. A maimah chazal, a posik, an idea, a svana, to be betachlis ha-emes, betachlis ha-kedusha. I'll tell you another interesting thing, Medeche, Chavdala Tishrei Tov Shinun, the Rebbe made a siyum on Mesech Tekelem. The Rebbe gave a, 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 a Mesech Tekelem, paid a Chavdala so the Hilbich of is known to those who know Mishnaya, so those who are available, and they say that that Perik, Shloisha Trisinheim. Shloisha Trisinheim. There are three types of shields. That Sikha the Rebbe was Megala. He wrote a Ha'ara that it's the yard site of his, uh, it's the yard site that he, for, for his grandmother, Rebbe Tzin Rachel, who was murdered by the Nazis. The Rebbe's mother's mother, Rebbe Tzin Rachel. And the Rebbe wrote then that when he was a young child, for some years in the summer, he would go to her in Nikolaev in Ukraine, Vitiplabi, and she would take care of me. Vichuli. So that I wrote in the Sikhana. The third type of shield is Tris Shemasachan, is called Ditzas Har Vayim, which means the joy of the Arabs. It's basically a little shield, which is a toy, a game. So it's tar, because it's not a regular case, it's not a utensil. There's three types of shields. One is Tommy Thomas Midras, one is Tommy Thomas Mace, Masachkin by Bakunfun, and then you have Tahiru Miklum, the, th- the, the last, the last uh, tris. It's the first mission in Pekel Mir Chavdal. Chavdal Tishit of Shinu. The Rebbe said a whole sikh, beautiful, amazing sikh about Shloisha Trisin, Alpi Niglan, and Alpi Chsidis, Amoida Gewaldika sikh, three types of Avelas, three types of Misa, three types of Nashamis, Gewaldika sikh. So the Rebbe said that Ditzas Haravayim, yeah, was a schoik and a hano mishuna by the Arabs. Yeah. Hano mishuna by the Arabs. Some strange hano. And uh, so, <laughs> so it was just like for a sport. So I can't remember exactly the words, but the Rebbe said, the Rebbe wrote on the side, he said, he was very shocked. He said, you don't know that most of the sports in Brooklyn, and I think that ever wrote sports in English, S-P-O-R-T-S, most of the sports in Brooklyn, Vachuli, are basically the same, where there's no actual, there's no actual substantial benefit from it. It's just for entertainment for the people who view it. So we use the word mishuna, that it's a weird thing. It's like we don't know about it. And the Rebbe said, you don't know that most sports, even in Brooklyn, et cetera, is exactly the same concept, which was quite, quite incredible, quite amazing. I'll tell you another very interesting thing. You can learn a lot from this. Tovshin Mem Zayin, the Rebbe said, maybe... Which sikh is it? Winter Memzayan. The Rebbe said that the, the Rebbe Dayat said, Medavtsu puts in the Kneplach. You have to polish the buttons. That's what's left. The uniform is ready, but you got to polish the buttons. The Rebbe said, because the buttons are fine, but they can have dust. They can have dust. The Rebbe said, the buttons, the, the Kneplach and Abin Stoib. Of English dust or Belaz dust. So you have to polish it from the dust. Now, if you were a maniach, would you put in the English word? 
doesn't really make sense. We're going to start translating every word in English. You would put in the Yiddish word, shtoib, dust. The Rebbe translated shtoib into dust. But when you put in the Yiddish word, the English word, it didn't really make sense. Yet we decided that Rebbe said it, put it in. The Rebbe wrote on the word dust, and he wrote, Alderich Hatzachos, dust is do sitra achera. Dust is do sitra achera. From here we learned that Rebbe translated a word into English. In the Fabrengen, Im Reiku Mikem, wasn't so simple. It was a Rosh Hashanah Tevis there. Dust, dust, sitra achera. If that's what the Rebbe was thinking when he translated, I don't know, he, or he wrote it later, Vesach Nisht. But that's what the Rebbe did. Dust is dust, sitra achera. My dearest Bachram Lach, but I see the hour is late. I was supposed to speak for half an hour, and I see it's already an hour. So let me take some questions, okay? Let me take some questions. If there are, you can chat your questions, and uh, I'll take them. But first, I'll respond to the questions that were written here. Some I answered. And some I didn't, so I'll answer them. What is the hardest part of being a maniach? Masif the earth mimim of Tramto. The answer to that is uh, I already discussed. Should we write whatever we hear as we're listening? Or should we write down points every minute or two? That's a Gavaldic question. You know, Mitzah Yamtif, they used to write the Fabrengans after Havdallah. There was no mic, because the Rebbe didn't dive in my or make Havdallah. But my brother, Rebbe David Feldman, earlier years, there were other Chayzerim, they would write down. So they usually wrote, as the Rebbe was saying, they tried to write every word, but as short as possible so they don't miss. But this is really, I don't know that there's one way of doing it. Should you write whatever you hear as you're listening? Yeah, but only if you're going to have a way to reconstruct that later because it's not going to come out good. So you could write down every word, but then you have to go it over and make sure it makes sense. Or you could do the other way. You write down points every minute or two. Both are, are fine options. Obviously, the first way, you might get much more in terms of details. What's the easiest way to retain the Sikhin memory? So I won't need to go back and watch it a second time before writing my Hanukkah. Masif to Lubavitch, Chicago. So listen to what I said earlier about how to remember. Is it better to write the Hanukkah in Yiddish or a language that you understand better? Yesh bazeh ma'ashem bazeh. Obviously writing it in Yiddish is the language of the Rebbe, so it has a tremendous maila. Writing it in the language you understand better has a maila as well. So I don't know what to tell you. There's a mile in this, there's a mile in this. Maybe try both. One time do this, one time do this. How do you remain focused on the sicha and the same time write down? This is Moshe Goldberg and all the Torah. Ooh, that's a good question. It's very hard. When you're writing down, you just have to completely tune into the words. It's very hard to do both. To stay focused on the sicha to write them, I don't know how you can do both. If you're really writing, unless you're writing every few minutes, unless you're listening, and every few minutes you just write down a line to capture it. But if you're mamish continuously writing, then you just have to tune into those words, and later you'll reconstruct it, and you can go back and listen again. Moshe Malul, Masifta, Teres Menachem, and Shriel. While you're writing notes of what the Rebbe is saying, the Rebbe is going further. How do you keep track of what the Rebbe is saying while you're taking notes? That's a very bad, it's very hard. It's very hard. You have to learn shorthand. You have to learn how to capture 20, the Rebbe is saying, speaking 30 words, how to capture that in five. Can you do that? Sometimes we would underline. We would underline a word like three times because you wanted to make sure you don't lose that word. But that's very hard. Listen, you're not going to be able to write down every word of what the Rebbe says because... After two minutes, you'll already be stuck. The Rebbe will be way ahead of you. You have to find a way of either writing everything, but in short, so you have Rashi Tevison, or you just know how to capture something in a few words, and later you will understand how to go back and develop it. 
because that can't be the final hanacha. Or, or you wait till the Rebbe finishes an idea and you just capture that in a sentence very, very fast because you don't want to miss the next idea. But don't expect perfection in this area. This is a very challenging task because the Rebbe said a lot and he said it fast and he said it not always fast, but sometimes fast and it's brief. What makes a hanacha a good hanacha? What can we do to improve? Mesifta of Coral Springs. What makes a hanacha a good hanacha, in my eyes, is a few factors. Number one, that it's readable. You can understand it. It's readable, okay? Which means you have to have punctuation marks, you have to have question marks, hyphens, periods, quotation marks, colon points. You have to have paragraphs. I saw today a few hanachas. No paragraphs. You have a page, 50 lines, run-on sentences connected to each other. That's not a hanacha that's readable. You have to follow the laws of grammar. Look at look at the sikhis. Look at the sikhis of the Rebbe. The Rebbe is there's a paragraph, another paragraph, another paragraph, another paragraph. There's sentences. Do you know? You also have to learn some grammar. Do you know the difference of a colon and a semicolon? You know the difference? It's very important. You won't be able to understand look at the sikhis without it. What's a dash? What's a hyphen? Why are some words italic? These are all principles. Without this, you will not understand the sikhis that are printed in look at the sikhis. Impossible. So you have to follow that. For Hanukkah to be good, it has to be readable. It should follow punctuation rules. Look, learn the Kutei Sichas and follow those punctuation rules. That's number one for a good Hanukkah. Number two, you should be able to understand it. First of all, it should be readable. Should be, the concepts should be clear. It should be understood. And of course, number three, the most important is it should capture what the Rebbe was saying, the truth of what the Rebbe was saying, and the spirit of what the Rebbe was saying. Those are the four factors that make a good hanach. Sometimes you'll have three, you won't have the fourth. Sometimes you'll have some, and you won't have the others. But those are the four factors that make a good hanach. First of all, it's readable. Number two, it's understandable. The ideas are conveyed clearly. Number three, it's loyal to what the Rebbe was saying. And number four, it captures the soul of what the Rebbe was saying. I heard Mendel Greenberg from Detroit, Masifta. I heard that around Tov Shinnun there was a change in the way the Rebbe said Sichis, and there was a radical change in who did Chazar and how the Chazar worked. Is this, is this correct? Can you tell us what, this, what did these changes consist of? Yeah, absolutely. And the answer to that is, by the way, before I get to this, the boys, you can ask your questions on chat. Right, Rabbi Itzakovitz? Do they know this? I don't know where they're supposed to chat to, but you could send a chat. Maybe you could tell them. Yes. They could chat them. Yes, they can send them to me. If they can send it to you directly, they can send it to me, and I'll and you'll send it to me. Yeah. Yeah. So if you want to ask a question, you can ask a question. In the meantime, I'm in the middle of Mendel Greenberg about what happened. Okay, so after the Rebetzin passed away, on Chavbeis Shvatov Shem Memches, the Rebbe started to fabring every Shabbos. There were already some changes noticeable. First of all, the Rebbe spoke lower, a little lower, a little more brief, a little more bekitzer, but it was in the summer where this real changes started. First of all, the last mimer was Shabbos Chukas Tov Shem Memches, if I'm not mistaken. After that, the Rebbe did not say my modem anymore. There were a few exceptions, like Erev Pesach Memtes and Erev Shvu is Tov Shem Memtes. Very few exceptions when the Rebbe said my modem. So the Rebbe stopped saying my modem on Shabbos, even a Maimer Kein Sichi. You know, there were two types of my modem. Then the Rebbe had a system of Fabrengens. The first Sicha was usually on the Parsha or on the Shabbos. The second Sicha was also on the Parsha or on the Shabbos or Yom Tov. The third was a Maim. And then would start the Rashi Sichas, the Zoya Sichas, the Rambam Sichas, Perkeyov Sichas, sometimes Eretz Yisrael, the Kesichas, other Sugis. The Rebbe would be Mashlim, Asiyah Mesechta from a previous Fabrengen or, or another, another, another explanation. <laughs> The Rebbe would respond to certain situations, questions, but there was a structure. You knew exactly the first two sikhs, number three was a maimer, and then after that was the second half of the fabrengen. It was a clear structure. In the summer of Tov Shem the Rebbe stopped that. I think the Rebbe stopped talking, uh, the Rebbe stopped uh, Zoyhars, and the Rebbe stopped, uh, at some point, Rashi sikhs, and some, the Rebbe started to speak about the Rashi Sikha, the first Sikha, the Rashi, the first Sikha. The whole structures of the Fabrengen, the Fabrengen stopped. This was already before Tav Shinon. 
summer Memches, it started and it got more and more and more dramatic. In the winter of Tavshin Memches, the Fabrengen started to get very short, much shorter, Pashat in time. I remember Vayeda, I think, I'm saying from memory, I think Shabbos Vayeda, the Rebbe finished the Fabrengen a little after three, which was shocking to the people because the Fabrengens would usually finish much later, an hour or two or three later. So it was a little after three. <laughs> I remember people were blaming poor Chazan Talashevsky because Chazan Talashevsky would wait for the Rebbe to tell him to sing, Yehirotzain. And the Rebbe would make like with his head as a little tnua. And uh, Chazan Talashevsky would wait. That was his thing, to sing Sheyibon Abbe Samikdash, Adana Devabrengen. And it was around 3.10 or 3.15 or 3.20, and the Rebbe looked in his direction and maybe made a little nod, and he right away jumped up and he ate And right after that, the Rebbe finished the Fabrengen. So poor Chazan Talashev, they blamed him that he did Sheyibon Abbe Samikdash too early. But I really don't think it was him. I, don't, I really don't know about this. If the Rebbe wanted to speak further, he could have speak, spoken after the Nigin Sheyibon Abbe Samikdash. But this already meant that everything is changing. And then afterwards, the Rebbe, many Shabbosim didn't speak a Rashi Sikh anymore. He stopped with the Zoyar. The Rambam, I think the Rebbe used to speak most Shabbosim. Uh, the Maimorim, I told you, stopped. Everything changed. Another thing that changed in those years, the Rebbe spoke physically lower. Another thing started that the Rebbe would start speaking very bekitzer, which means instead of elaborating on something bariches, the Rebbe would say on the Kudna, and he would say, Kemedubar, or just or as we spoke in a previous Fabrengen. Sometimes he would say like we spoke in previous years. Another thing that happened was, especially as time progressed, the Rebbe started to start the Fabrengen with the Indian of Gula. I remember Parshas Mikates Nonalov, the Rebbe said, well, when you're at Sukkot in something, you find in everything a connection to that. And he said, now the koch is geula. So the Rebbe said, parshas miketz, right away the connection to geula. And sometimes, after two or three minutes, the Rebbe would already start with a bracha for Mashiach. But that bracha could continue for a half an hour. And from the bracha, the Rebbe was really discussing the theme of the Fabrengen. So it became very, very difficult to grasp it. Because the whole structure was completely transformed. I still... Remember it, I think it was Shabbos Bechukoy Saitov Shemem Tes. I think it was an hour sicha, and I'm not exaggerating, that ever covered probably more than a hundred topics. He went from one theme to another theme to another theme, another theme. and the Rebbe was saying ideas, but he did not give an idea more than a minute or a half a minute. The Rebbe would just reference it, say an idea. So it was very, very difficult to grasp. And not all of it was remembered. I'm telling you honest, for sure there were things that were forgotten. We did the best we can, but some of those fabrengens were very difficult. The Rebbe could start off with the Gula, some theme connected to the Gula, and then two or three, four, five minutes later, he would start with a bracha. The Rebbe would say, that we should see, and this is connected. And he could discuss Arambam, and he could discuss Ayurashamia, and he discuss Ayamtif, and he could discuss the Parsha, and he could discuss a Gemara, and he could discuss a Maimon Lukutatayra, and he could discuss something that's going on in the Jewish world, but it was all in a bracha, and then it would go back to the bracha. So in those years, the whole structure changed. Some Fabrengans were different than others, but it was very hard to know. But the original structures of Fabrengans of the previous years ceased. <clears throat> so it was, and, and it was, as I told you, it was very bikitsis. So it was not easy. It was not easy to grasp. If you want to really understand what I'm saying, you could listen to a tape of the Sikhis of the Rebbe, Yud and Yud Aleph Elu. Tovshin Nun Aleph, Parshas Kiseitze. It was the days of the pogrom after Yankel Rosenbaum's murder in Crown Heights. Those sikhs, I don't remember, a half an hour, an hour, and you listen to those sikhs, you'll see that Rebbe discussed dozens and dozens and dozens of topics, very deep, but it's so difficult to understand the structure and the pervading theme, the chut hamakashr of the sikh. I still remember, I still remember because I wrote a Hanukkah of it. It was from weekday, so we had a tape. But to understand it, the Rebbe, I remember, he spoke about Kiseitse, La Melchama Levecha. He spoke about Kibbutz Goliath, May Arba Kanfis Haaretz. From there, the Rebbe went in to Tzitzis, 
Arba Confess. From there, he went into Miruboyas, corners that are square. And from there, the Rebbe went in to discuss the two types of tzimtzumim that are discussed in Kabbalah. Tzimtzum Bederich Miruba and Tzimtzum Bederich Igum. And you had to figure out the connection between all of these things. So it was extremely, extremely intricate and profound and full of Ramazan. And it was sometimes very, very difficult. An interesting thing to think about it was Tesvav Siv and Tavshim Em Tes. The Rebbe came back from the oil very late. If I'm not mistaken, was one of the latest Mincha and Maidivs. And I saw when the Rebbe came back, the Rebbe was, looked very, very exhausted. And then the Rebbe said, Asicha, about snakes, suvma, makhishim, zaza, chava, kosova, shlishi, vechriya, beinea. And I have to tell you, it was like a throwback from the older years. And it was almost the middle of the night. The Rebbe didn't eat a whole day, he was fasting. So organized, for, from our perspective, das tachta. Organized, clear. I remember Shabbos, the Rebbe continued it. Shabbos Nasai. Shnek so makhishim zaza. The Rebbe asked them why you need two psukim to fight with each other. And then you need a kasav ashlishi. Don't make a machloi, because you don't need a kasav ashlishi. The Rebbe said amazingly that you need the contrasts, you need the extremes, because each pasik gives you an extreme. And if you don't have that, you're missing it. You're just going to have a compromised life. You need to have this extreme, you need to have this extreme, and then you have to have a kasav ashlishi. And he explained the idea of diri betachtoinim. Atmos, Tachtoinim, and then you have a Kosov Ashlishi. It was Hafladik. Another interesting thing is the last Fabreng in Shabbos Vayakel was unusual. The first Sikha was, I think, 55 minutes, close to an hour, maybe, yeah, I think around 55 minutes. And most of the topics were with tremendous Arichis, tremendous husband. The Rebbe spoke loud, even by the bleachers they can hear. Remember, I told somebody, Mitzoy Shabbos Vayakel, some Pella, how the Rebbe spoke today. The Rebbe explained himself much more, which in the later years, the Rebbe relied much more on the previous year's sikhs. So Chazorah became much more difficult. There were some people who would quit a little bit because they were just, it was very hard to, it was very hard to retain. It was not, some Fabrengans were very hard to retain. Is it better to write word for word how the Rebbe said it or better the points, the question, the answer, Masif to Lubavitch, Chicago? Yesh baze mashain baze. There's a gewaldic maila in Oisius Harav, because Oisius Harav is sacred. It's like a pchin of shchina medaberis, mitach groine. There's something that chsidim cherished Oisius Harav kemoishahim, without anything. There's also a gewaldic maila in having the idea concrete, compacted, clear. Again, I say yesh baze mashain baze. Both are excellent. Obviously, for readers, the points are much easier to grasp. For yourself, both are good. I, I, I would not, I would not, there's an advantage of this and an advantage of this. Shnei Suva Marchishim Zezah. Moshe Aaron Gazinski, Eirel Chanan Chabat. When writing a Hanachi, you're supposed to write everything that Ebbe says, or should you try to summarize it as short as possible in your words? The answer is, Again, there's a tremendous advantage in the first and in the second. Sometimes I would do this, sometimes I would do this. Each one is exceptional. To write exactly and everything that Ebbe says is very, very valuable. I don't have to explain. To summarize it as short as possible in your words is also very advantageous because it makes it yours. Remember, in our work of teaching and communicating, I can't always repeat word for word what the Rebbe said. I have to make it mine. I have to internalize it. I have to see how I'm going to give it over. I have to know what works for the audience. This is explained in Chassidus as pre tzimtzum and post tzimtzum. Pre tzimtzum is you have the air the way it is, unfiltered, unadulterated, uncompromised. That's pre tzimtzum. Post tzimtzum is through a filter. Everything is mitzumtzum. Which one is better, the air before the tzimtzum, the air past the tzimtzum? What's the answer, Chevre? No, the air before the tzimtzum, that's where it is. That's MS, ain't soif. But did it with the you need the air after the tzimtzum. So that's my answer to your hanachas. There's pre tzimtzum hanachas and there's post tzimtzum hanachas. No, which is better? The chlal by bach the monsech mer fire tzimtzum, pre tzimtzum. You'll have time for nachim tzimtzum later. Now, this age is better pre tzimtzum.
Dudi. Dudi Erlich Mesifta Ert Mimim in Tranta. How can what we're doing, what we're doing, is it considered hamachis? If we miss something, we can go back to the video and listen. Manich, we're not able to do that. That's true. By the weekdays, we can also go back and listen, but it was still hamacha. Just because you can go back and listen doesn't mean it's not hamacha. We used to write hamachas from the Fabrengans in the weekdays. It was still hamacha, even though we can go back and listen. What you're doing is... You, what you're doing is you're doing a tremendous thing because you're doing it for yourself. It's a gift for yourself and it's a gift for everybody you're going to come in contact with now and throughout your entire life. How are you able to keep in your mind what the Rebbe said till after Shabbos? How are you able to retain all that information? Clerman, Masifta, Miami. Great question. And I addressed it earlier in my words. New Haven. What do you need to include in your Anach in order for it to be Anach? Every detail or main points? The main points are critical. The, the details give it, of course, more uh, accuracy. But the main points, I think, are the main points. Is it okay to rewrite the order of the Sikha to make it flow better and not go in the order that ever went? Yeah, it's okay. It's okay. It, it just has to be clear that you're organizing it. But it's okay. In fact, the Rebbe wanted the Anachas should be written that way. The Rebbe wanted the Anachas should be written in the way that everything is clear and categorized. So if the Rebbe said something at the end of the Sikh, which really was part of the questions, the Rebbe would expect it to be put into the questions. The way that we used to do it is, there was somebody who would type up the Sikh from the weekdays, word for word, usually Hirschler, Tzvi Hirschnatik in my years, he would take the Fabrengen or the Sikha from the weekdays and type it up word for word, word. If the Rebbe repeated himself, he would put in this repetition. The Rebbe said a word three times, he would put it in. It was word for word. And then we worked with that transcript word for word and wrote based on it, but very often organized it in different ways. I would like a tip how I can get every point that Rebbe is saying on paper, how to keep up with the Sikha. What points do I put down? How do I put them down? Where do the commas and periods go? Can I put my commentary on the Sikha? I answered some of this before. You could put your own commentary on the Sikha, but I think your commentary should be either at the end or in the beginning or in the middle. You can have brackets and give your own commentary. That's fine. It's actually nice, but it should be, it should be clear that this is your commentary. And I encourage all of you, when you finish a Hanukha, to give commentary in the sense of really making sure you got it and putting it in context of other sikhs. And here's the most important thing. What did I take out of it? What did I learn from this? Where can I change from this? What did I learn new in my head? What did I learn new in my heart? This is a great thing to do. Being on weekday fabrengans, there were recordings. Was Shabbos the only day that the Chayzim had to remember or also weekdays? Remembering was only on Shabbos in my years. The early years, not necessarily because I didn't even know if there was always a tape and it wasn't always available. Has the Rebbe spoken or encouraged anything to the Manichim about being a Meniach? In the earlier years, there was. In my years, not that I know of. How long approximately... My father once told me that the Rebbe mentioned something to him on Yechidus and Tav Ches. How long approximately did it take you to write up a Hanukha? It took a very long time. It was not easy to write a Hanukha. Hanukha could take a whole night, a whole day, sometimes a whole week you worked on it. A Fabrengen, a whole Fabrengen. Sometimes it was a good few days, a whole week. How long should it take for us, Bachem, to write a Hanukha on a 20-minute video? Uh... It could take a whole day. If it takes a few hours, it's not surprising. It's a few hours and you look it over and review it. It could take a whole day. Sometimes it could take two days if you're doing a good job. Let me see if there's any other questions. Rabbi Yitzhakovich, do we have any other questions? I just received one question, so I'll just mention that or Rabbi Yitzhakovich collects the others. If the Chayzrim sometimes were challenged did they ever rely on the crowd for help of Chazar? If they didn't remember anything, did they ever rely on the crowd for Chazar? Were there any such instances? Not that I know of. I mean, those of the crowd who were, who were really qualified were somehow connected to Chazar, meaning there were Balabatim or Yidin who were big Talmudic Chachamim, 
and they may have not been chayzidim in terms of their career or vocation, but they were, you know, no one to be involved. They would sit by the fabrengas, they would kachzich in the fabreng, and so obviously a chayzidim may call them or uh, discuss it with them. So that was common, that was common. But again, those who were, those who would be asked were people who on a good day were involved. So they were like somehow connected because in Chayzim itself, there were different levels. There were those who Mamash did it, you know, Yoimam Valayla, this was their thing a whole week. And these were those who did it when they were Bachrim and later moved on, but say they stayed connected. And then there were those who, you know, they were somehow involved on some level in one way or another. So there was, in Chayzim themselves, there were quite a few uh, different madregas and different categories. Uh, the two manichim ever have a dispute over what the Rebbe said? <laughs> yeah, of course, there were always disputes. Rebbe Yoel Khan would make a chazor in Mitzoy Shabbos downstairs in 770 in my years. <laughs> and there were often a lot of arguments. The Rebbe said this, the Rebbe said that, the Rebbe meant that, the Rebbe meant that. <laughs> The Bioyal himself would sometimes get upset with one of the Chayzrim or the people there by Chazan and say, not a shkait and shtusim, he didn't understand. But uh, but there were debates. There were debates, first of all, what did Rebbe said? Did the Rebbe say this? Did Rebbe say that? Sometimes the debates were understanding what the Rebbe said. That too. It wasn't an argument on the words, but it was an argument understand. It happened constantly. It happened constantly. Sometimes big debates, sometimes important debates about what the Rebbe said. There was no question. And remember, there were Hanachas that Rebbe saw and that Rebbe wrote uh, very often. Uh, very often. That Rebbe wrote pretty often. It seems like you did not understand the whole theme that I said. There was ones that Rebbe wrote on a Hanacha, and not as a compliment, word for word from the tape. Ois ba ois. Mila be mila me ha tape. And the Rebbe was not very happy about that. In other words, his point is, you took the tape and you typed it up and the whole Anoch is word for word from the tape. The Rebbe did not want that. Because speaking and writing is never the same. Unless you're speaking or written, unless you're saying something that you wrote, like you, you're giving a, you're communicating a speech that you wrote, the, word of, the world of speaking and the world of writing is two different worlds. Because in speaking... You can get away with things. You can repeat yourself, the way you connect sentences, etc. In writing, you have to be much more concise and much more brief. You can't repeat yourself, because if you're repeating yourself, you have to ask yourself, why are you doing this? The person just read it. So writing is in a completely different creature than speaking. And the Rebbe knew that, of course, and the Rebbe expected that. Don't just write word for word from the tape. Edit it, make it compact, make it sharp, make it concise. I remember the Rebbe once wrote to us after Yom Kippur, I think Tov Shanun or Nunalif, one of the later years. The Rebbe said, Bechlal, when you put something on paper and you're sending it to print, you have to do it Bekitzer. <laughs> the Rebbe wrote, because he, he X'd out a paragraph, which was explaining more the previous paragraph. The Rebbe said, Bechlal, the Klal is as brief as can be. Don't. Uh, don't make it flowery. The Rebbe was not a chassid of making it flowery. The kids, even though in speaking sometimes, he was much more elaborate. So there were, there were arguments. Uh, sometimes the Rebbe wrote sharp comments on certain hanachas. Uh, the Rebbe wrote, was not always pleased. <laughs> the Rebbe once wrote on a sikha that it's male chidushim, chidushim mamish. Meaning, this sikha is filled with real, real chidushim. And it sounded like Chidushim that even he was not thinking about when he said them. Uh, there were different comments that ever once wrote something very sharp on a Sikha. He said, I put a lot of patches. You know, you remember? I don't know if you remember the olden days, kids a lot of times had torn pants and mommy couldn't afford another pair of pants. So they put lattice patches all over the pants. You had, you can have 10 patches on your pants or five patches. It was called in Yiddish lattice. It's still called in Yiddish lattice. So the Rebbe wrote, Kam kol halatis, eze oizen yeshla, aza oizen yeshla. Even I patched up the sikha and it still looks horrible. Uh, the Rebbe once wrote, I think more than once, 
After 30 years, I'm not going to teach you olive base. Uh, after 30 years, I'm not going to teach you olive base. So the Rebbe was very, uh, often very, very sharp. Uh, as I told you, the Rebbe wanted excellence. The Rebbe believed in people, and uh, especially people who were writing his own Torah on his behalf. The Rebbe wanted, wanted excellence. And, the Rebbe <laughs> and it was not always excellence. You know, people are people and people are flawed. Another important thing let me answer this. Uh, who was the main machria in the Hanukkah? Rabbi Yoel? I don't know if it was always Rabbi Yoel. Rabbi Yoel, obviously, all the years that he wrote, he was the writer in the machria. I think he was often the machria, very often the machria. If he was always the machria, I don't know if he was always the machria. Love Dafke. I guess I would be accurate in saying that it basically boiled down to the person who was writing it, you know, at the end of the day, in most cases. But Rabbi Yoel was often the machri. Of course, sometimes they would ask the Rebbe. The Rebbe would often answer, and the Rebbe would sometimes not answer. The Rebbe would answer Bixav, or sometimes answer at another Fabrengen. Sometimes the answer was very elaborate. Sometimes the answer was very, very brief. Sometimes the answer was very, very sharp. There were times the Rebbe would answer, especially on Rashi Sichis, he would say, Yishalu bein chamesh lemikra. And go ask a five-year-old child and he'll tell you, he'll tell you the answer. He'll tell you the answer. I still remember it was one year Truma. When was it Truma? The Rebbe spoke about the Rashi, that the kapiris, the lid on the arm was oivya tefach. It had the thick of a tefach. And the Rebbe said, how does Rashi know? Why does it belong in Pshutish Lamikra? It doesn't say in Chumash. Why does Rashi have to put it in? And the Rebbe said then that it has to do with understanding how gold works. If anybody knows how gold works, when you have a lid of gold covering the whole urn, it's going to cave in. And Rashi knew that every child who learns this knows if you know about gold, it's going to cave in. So Rashi has to say, oh, how did it not cave in? So he has to say that it was a tefach. A very interesting answer. So there was an answer, a question the Manechim sent in the middle of the week after Shabbos. I, st- I don't remember the whole answer, but I still remember that Rebbe told them they should go home and try it out with cardboard. <laughs> the Rebbe said, go. He gave them an arts and crafts directive. Go and sh- yenasu bekarton vekayotza Go try it out with cardboard or something similar. And they will be shocked from the results. The Rebbe gave the Manichim Arts and Crafts Directives. I'm telling this to you from memory. This is Mem Zion. It's how many years? Nun Zion. So again, 33, 34 years ago. So I could be it's a little inaccurate. But it was once the Rebbe made a picture. I remember Chav Cheshen Mem the Rebbe spoke about Aleph. And the Rebbe, made a, the Rebbe said that they used to teach they used to make pictures of the letters, so they made a picture of somebody carrying two uh, two buckets of water, you know, a vasetreger, a, a stick on his back, and two buckets were hanging for an aleph. So I don't think they understood clearly what the Rebbe meant. So in the Hanukha, the Rebbe, the Rebbe made a picture. <laughs> the Rebbe made a picture of, uh, of the person carrying the buckets. There were a lot of fascinating things. I remember this happened with me. Uh, the Rebbe spoke about the Posik in Kisovoy as Hashem Mircha Hayoim. Right? As Hashem Mircha Hayoim. As Hashem Marta, Hashem Mircha, right? Hamarta Mircha. So the Rebbe spoke about Hamarta Mircha. So we quoted a Rashi. We quoted a Rashi. Rashi says, I think it's a Rashi in Brochus. So Rashi says, Kemoi Yis Amru Kolpoyale Oven. Those who do wicked things, those who do iniquities, is Amru, they boast, they brag, they're proud of themselves. So it means you have boasted, you have glorified Hashem, and Hashem has glorified you. Come on, Yis Amru In those years, especially the early years, the Rebbe was very, very sensitive about Losh and Nikia. Always, the Rebbe was always sensitive, but the later years, the Rebbe was very makbed to speak positive about everything, about every Jew, about every phenomenon. 
Rashi says, Kama Yisamru Kalpoyale of it. So I guess it could have written Chulu, but I didn't. I wrote out the whole Rashi. Kama Yisamru Kalpoyale of it. The Rebbe added, V'yashloimar, the Mirama is Boza, Al Mailas is Hapcha. Rashi intimates the mile of transformation. Right away, the Rebbe took a poyale oven and he said, the Psalm, what's vikumta yisamru kal poyale oven to us Hashem and Mirch? It's two opposites. Here you're glorifying the Rebbeinah Shalolam and here your sinners are glorifying themselves. Yeshlein was at the Meram is almailas, almailas is hapch. It was just, it showed how the Rebbe did not uh, forfeit an opportunity to transform darkness darkness into light. There was one year that Rebbe said, the Rebbe said that those who didn't get mashke should go in tomorrow to Maskiris and get mashke to bring home for Fabrengen in their city. So in the Sikha, the Maniach wrote it. So the Rebbe made a star on, they should go into Maskiris and he wrote, V'ha'ikir li'hikonis li'inyonei zecher v'zikorin which means the Rebbe is going into Maskiris. Now, a person is reading a Sikha, he, a week later, he's not going into Maskiris. Maskiris is the secretariat. So the Rebbe says the main thing is to go into Maskiris, to go into the concept of Zecher, Zikorin, remembering. Look at the Maimonim of Parsha Zacher, what the concept of, of Zikorin is. You saw here the Diuk, the Diuk in a word. Next question. How did the Hanukkah work for Nosoi Nun Aleph? Ooh, you're bringing up memories. Nosoi Nun Aleph. You know what Nosoi Nun Aleph is? <laughs> Nosoi Nun Aleph, we'll never forget. It was Yud Bey Sivan, I think, right? Somewhere that time. That zip code. It was Shabbos afternoon. 770 was usually empty. It was a long Shabbos. The Fabrengen ended hours earlier. My cousin made up a Kiddush. I think he had a daughter. I had a cousin who made a Kiddush on Lefferts. So I went to the Kiddush. I was there with my brother. We were walking home. We were walking down Kingston Avenue. I think we were chazaring the Fabrengen from Shabbos. I had to give chazorim. It's our Shabbos. Somebody runs over to us and says, The Rebbe is Fabrengen. Okay, I thought the guy, you know, the Rebbe's for bringing Shabbos afternoon. It was soon, it was almost Maidav time. It was, it was Shkia time. The Rebbe, the Rebbe, the Rebbe's for bringing. My brother said, it's impossible. Check it out. So I checked it out. I ran. I came into 770. I came into 770. They were starting the niggin of Bnei Hechala. The Rebbe came in, you know, he washed, he went to his bimah, the Rebbe ate a little challah, he said a, a short sikha, and then they sang all the nigunim of the Rebbeim, and then the Rebbe said another longer sikha, and then I think another sikha. I came in, they started Bnei Hechala. There wasn't a big oilam, but the pushing was incredible because the oilam was coming in, and it was a shock. So uh, I knew that we're going to have to remember this for Benayin, and the pushing was unbearable. I couldn't get to the front. It was just impossible. I couldn't get to the front. So what I did was, I climbed up on a beam, one of those beams, because among the crowd, it was just impossible. You couldn't concentrate. I climbed up on a beam and I held on like this to the beam. And I heard the sikha, the next sikha I heard, I heard it well, but it was not easy because I had to hold on to the beam and people were pushing me down because I was blocking them. It happens to be, Rabbi Yoel, Rabbi Yoel Khan was behind me on a table, and I saw that he was telling people they shouldn't push me down, because it was hard in the, it was hard to hear, but I could hear, because I was close. So I think they stopped pushing me down, so I, I got to hear the second sikha well, and I think the third sikha, I pushed it, got very nauseous. I got nauseous, I couldn't stay there anymore. I, my system... And when the Rebbe finished, I right away plopped down and I I ran out. I went upstairs to the sink near the Yichud room, near Reb Shmuel's room, near WLCC, and I threw up. <laughs> I threw up over there. I threw up over there and uh, and that was that. But I had this chus to write the Hanukkah of, I think, the last two sikhs. The second sikha 
was a pretty long sicha. I don't know if you know, we still don't know what happened at that Fabrengen. It was a sudden Fabrengen, 8 o'clock at night, with Koshel Bracha, right after Matan Torah. An interesting thing is, I'm not saying this as a fact because I don't know. I'm just telling you my own feelings, right or wrong. That Shabbos was an incredible, incredible miracle. Mifts Shloima, they called it. You know, right? Israel brought thousands of Ethiopian Jews. They kidnapped them and they brought them illegally on airplanes to Israel, saving their lives. They took them from Sudan. They were guaranteed a death. But death, thousands and thousands of Jewish men, women, children, Ethiopians were brought to Eretz Yisrael that Shabbos. It was a secret, top secret. The person who gave all the planes just passed away a few months ago. Extraordinary human being. It's a whole parsha. What's my mocker for this? I, we heard the story afterwards, and then I thought the two are maybe connected. But also the second sikh that Rebbe spoke a lot about Shleim HaMelech. Shleima Melech was called Mifza Shleima because uh, Kush, Ethiopia. Shleima Melech had, you know, his relationships, his connections. The Rebbe spoke about Shleima a few times in the Sikha, Padre B'Shalom, Shleima HaMelech, Shleima Melech, and Shleima. He spoke about his name, the Beis HaMiktesh by Shleima. Just telling you, a Hergish, I had maybe one Indian that was connected to that, Fabrengens, perhaps not. That was Nasa in Analov. The first Sikha I didn't chaza because I wasn't there yet. I missed the first Sikha. Next, uh, did the Rebbe say clearly that the way my modem and sikhah should be written and printed considerably different than the Rebbe said it? Because you want to get the toichen written down and it might be different from the way you want to say it. Is this also could be that the my modem recorded when they were written built in Muga, some paragraphs are in a different order? Yeah, over the years, the Rebbe was very clear how to write something. And now listen, there were many writers. You have to understand something. When Manichim write things, it's the Rebbe's writing, it's the Rebbe's works, but it's the way it's filtered through their talents, through their pen, and through their brain, and through their heart. It's very important to understand that. Manichim are people. Sometimes they were exceptional Manichim. Some were extraordinary writers. Some were not. Some grasped an amazing, an amazing way. Some grasp less, some grasp deeper, some grasp more superficial. Some more complex, some more clear. Some more intricate, and some more klolizdik. With some manichim, there's a lot ben hashuris. There's a lot that's unsaid. It's called muk of gvil, the parchment around the letters. What's not said? Koyach ha-gvul, koyach ha-helem, ein soif. And there's those that everything is said. So fell debate. There's a lot of different types of manichim, and uh, manichim have their mindless, and they also have their chesreinus. Here's a klal. But but generally, manichim try to do the best they can according to their capabilities, and we're very grateful for everything they did. Uh, and again, I'll tell you. I'll tell you. I read the sichus. I know the manichim. Some of them are very close to me. I worked with a lot of manichim. There's nothing that compares to listening and watching the Rebbe saying the sicha. To Oisis Arav. And not because the Hanachas are not good. Sometimes the Hanachas are excellent. Sometimes they're not excellent. Sometimes they're excellent. But there's nothing that compares to it. There's nothing that compares to it. You just can't compare. You take the Purim Fabrengens. You take the Purim Fabrengens of the Yuds, of the Chafs, of the Lamads, the Mems, there's nothing like them. If you want to know what it means to be a Jew in the 20th century, 21st century post-Holocaust, you go through the Purim Fabrengens, you know what a Jew is. <laughs> the Rebbe's Ashkofe, so it's like Gossen, with Teure, with Ashkofe, with Emune, the Nichnes Yayin Yotzer uh, Rabbi Yoske Gop is a shlich in Hartford. He once told me, I asked him, where do you see Purim Adela Yade by the Rebbe? So he said, well, what is Gizen in the Torah? The Torah of Purim was Adela Yade. So it's a gigosen, gigosen. With the way the Rebbe spoke, he spoke about Chinuch. He spoke about Amalek. He spoke about what a moon is. And he spoke about what the Hepech of a moon is. He spoke about the Nisyonis in America. 
the nenu misudosa shaloi sui rosha, the sikhis nenu misudosa. You can't be a Jew without these sikhis. You can't live, you can't understand what it means to be a Jew without these sikhis. The sikhis of anti Semitism, Purim Chafei, the Balhatel, the Balachritz, the, 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 the sikhis about how the Megillah is structured, the Biurim in the Megillah. It's half of a fella. I'm just giving you an example. The Hanochis are amazing, but nothing comes close to hearing the Sikhs from the Rebbe's mouth for a few reasons. First of all, the Pinimius of the Rebbe comes out in the Rebbe's talking. You're not going to get that in the writing. Maybe you'll get a little bit of it, but you can't get what's the Loshana Sanhedrin. It's brought in via Daita Moskva. Tavna de Libi like Kasva Inchi. Right? You know the Gemara in Sanhedrin? The Sanhedrin says they can't start a court case Friday because Shabbos ain't done, and so they have to continue Sunday. And uh, they're not going to remember their, 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 their arguments from the day before. So the Gemara says, why don't they just write it down? And he says, you can't write down the heart. The nafshi yotza bedabre from the Rebbe, you can't get in the written word. Not chas v'sholem, that the written word is not amazing, but it's just, it's a different, it's a different metzias. That's why it's such a gewaldic union to listen to the sikhs. I'm giving an example of Purim. You listen to the Siyam of Masech, the, ha- the Siyam of Makis, Yud Shema Tov I don't know. Uh, I think there were 10 Sikhs in the Fabreng, and most of the Sikhs were Siyam on Makis. They never made a Siyam on Makis for hours and hours and hours, and he continued it the next Shabbos. Yeah, yeah, Siyam and Makis. Yeah, he had to learn Ashtikul Gemada, this last two stories of, 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 uh, of Rebbe Kiva Mesachik. With the Rome and the Fox, my base Kotcha Akadoshim. Ah, the Rebbe asked like 20 kashas on the Gemara. You hear how to learn a Gemara, the uptight a Gemara, you hear how they ask a question on a Gemara, the Loshan a Gemara, Akiva Nechamtonu Nechamtonu. The Rebbe goes through every time it says in Shas Akiva Nechamtonu, Rishi Shonadav Chafei, Rebbe Kiva, three times Rebbe Kiva helps a Yeshua deal with crisis. There's a Mishnah in Rosh Hashanah and Chafei, a Gemara in Rosh Hashanah and Chafei, and Soif Makis. And one, first time it says Nicham Tanu one, second time it says Nicham Tanu twice. The, the, the Koch of the Rebbe, the Pnimius and Nefesh of the Rebbe, you can't get in the written word. It comes out, especially when the Rebbe would start crying and you just hear the Rebbe's, when the Rebbe would scream or the Rebbe would just express himself even when he was not screaming. Another thing, the Rebbe's humor the Milsad of the Rebbe would often put in humor, you know, funny, interesting comments. They didn't make it into Lakut Yisichis, because Lakut Yisichis is very edited. You're not going to have the, the Rebbe's humor. Also, a lot of the Rebbe's Derech Agavs, the Rebbe would give Derech Agavs constantly. And a, the Rebbe, from the Rebbe's Derech Agav, you could build hey Cholos after hey Cholos. Oilamus. I'll tell you, I have given dozens, hundreds of very powerful speeches from these Derech Agavs. Avortina, Uptachina Gemora, and Uptachina Rashi, and Uptachina Maisa, and Uptachina God of Chazal, Avortin Hashkov, it was Derech Agavs. And look at the Sikhs, you're not going to get it. So it's very, very critical to learn the Kutta Sikhs, to know the Kutta Sikhs, all the Ha'adas, the Maramekaimis. The Rebbe worked hard on the Kutta Sikhs, and there's tremendous Ga'inis and Chidushim and Kol Chelki Atayra. But there's something absolutely unique. To just listen to the Rebbe's Fabrengans and Sikhs. All the years, the Yuds and the Chafs and the Lamads, the Chuli, the Mems, the Nuns, just to listen and, and, and re- not just listen, to get a feel for it, to get an understanding of it. Something so powerful. You, you can, the Siyume Mesechtas of the Rebbe, the Siyume of the Rebbe the, the Mesechtas, yeah? You take Chavdalet Tevis Tafshin Yud Beis, it was a Siyum Anid, a Siyum Ashas. Yeah? The Sikhs in Chelek Zayin Parshas Mitzayr. Rabbi Yochanan and Rishlokish, Chatsi Shir, Ziva, Yud Alef Yoim, Amayda de Kesich. But you have to listen the way the Rebbe says it. Diamonds, the way the Rebbe says it, how he touches up Chatsi Shir, how he touches up Nid, Ziva, Machloikis, Rabbi Yochanan. First of all, you learn how to learn, how to think, how to say something, how to explain something. The way the Rebbe conveys the Svaras and the Kashas. Look at this, it's different. It was edited. The Rebbe wanted it should be edited. And a lot of derech agavs are cut out. And again, in Lukut Yisichus, things are much more bekitzer. And then generally, when you write, it has the hagbalus of writing. That's why it's incredibly powerful and transformative in your Torah, in your avoida, in your Yer Shemayim, in your Avas Hashem, Avas Torah, Avas Yisrael, in your development as, as people and as Jews and as Chassidim. 
to be able to listen and absorb the sikhis, uh, whatever is available on tape, I guess today we call it MP3, especially you hear, I, st- I still remember, you know, I, you hear the hadron of the Rebbe on Rambam, Tav Shem Lamed Hey, uh, you listen to the sikhis, you kislev chafei. I'm just throwing out things that come to memories, just one after another, incredible stuff. Yud Aleph, I mean, everybody knows Yud Shvat Lamed Beis, you know. Yud Aleph Nisan Lamed Beis, Adam Laamal Yulad. You have it in a sikh. Look at the sikh is Chelek Tesvav, Parshas Lech Lecha, has Yud Aleph Nisan Tav Shem Lamed Beis. It takes the Nekud and captures it, and the Rebbe was moisiv there, a whole shtickle over the Fabreng. But you hear how the Rebbe develops sikh after sikh after sikh, why Hashem made that we have to work in life, that we're not satisfied with free lunch. To be able to go out from a nivra and to become a boire, it's priceless, what should I tell you? This molds, it molds a Jew, this makes a Jew. The chayis you get in Yiddishkeit, how to look at the world, how to look at yourself, how to deal with struggle, how to deal with gullus, how to deal with darkness, how to deal with crisis, how to be there for people, how to change the world. It's an undeveloped. Most important, how to live with Geula, the Rebbe's eyes of Geula. Did it betachtoinim? This the sichus make you a they make you a mitzias chadasha, a gershin is guy like a cotton shenayz adami like by matan teira. Let's see if there's other questions here. Uh, oh wow, a lot of questions. I see you guys woke up. I'm asking you for questions. Are you no kechelnim? It's a chuv gevekt from the chalaymas. Okay, let's see some other questions here. What's main piece of advice you would give to the Bachrim regarding their Hanacha? The main piece of advice I would give you is don't give up. <laughs> Yiyush, I heard from the Rebbe, Yiyush is Shaloi Midas. Yiyush means you don't have Das. That's how the Rebbe touched a Gemorim Baba Metziah. Not Yiyush, Shaloi Midas. Yiyush is Shaloi Midas. If you have das, there's no yish. Don't give up. Try, try again. Learn from others. <clears throat> Take hamnaches that were written, whatever language you're writing, and see, learn from them. When you learn a sikh in Lukut Sikhis, or you learn a sikh in any of the Svarim, learn from it. See how it was written. See how to write something. And enhance it. Give it to other people for criticism. That would be my advice to you. Next question. If I keep writing Hanachas, will I easily be able to quote or pull things from different Sikhs? I don't know. Depends how good you become at it. If you mamish, if you mamish start mastering the Sikhs, you'll right away start being Madama Milsa Lamilsa. You'll know a suge, you say, ah, did I be disgusted here? Did I be disgusted here? Did I be disgusted here? So that would be, that's, that's very powerful. But that really depends. Every person will from sure delay. Don't try to master everything. It never works like that. It's like in Torah. When you're learning something, learn it well, chazer it, retain it, and then slowly it builds and builds and builds. It doesn't happen in one day. It's la'at la'at. And don't get frustrated if you don't know everything. You know what I mean? Like the Mishnah says in Prekayavis, you're not going to finish it. You're not responsible to finish it. <laughs> you know, Okay, But some of you still want to sit on a Shagas or a Chef Schmeitzer, or on a Sivis Amishpit, or on a Bchayim. So, whatever you want to sit at, I wish you tremendous Hatzlocha in all aspects of your life, especially in Teirasu Yom Nasa, you should continue to steig in your learning, Hatzlocha Moflaga, in your Limud Hanigla, in your Limud Hachsidis, Metay Chavone, and Hasaga, and Achayis, and Agishmak. To be able to go mechayel el chayel and teira and avodeg melis chasadim and your davening and your mitzvahs and your avos yisrael and your avos hashem and your avos teira, the Rebbe used to say all of them are one. You should have atzloch in begashmius and in ruchnius ad bli I am so proud of you. I love you, and uh, you are a tremendous source of inspiration. 
and blessing to all of us, to all of the Jewish people, to the world. I know that the Rebbe is shepping nachas from you, just like all of us are shepping nachas from you. And uh, you guys are amazing and unbelievable. And uh, continue trucking. And I know that we all have setbacks and there's uh, bumps on the road and there's stumbling, stumbling blocks, like Reb Mendel Futafas used to say. Don't get nispal from the world around you. And the ik is nish nispal from zichalein. Don't get nispal from the Yetzirah and the Nefesh Abamas inside. Know who you really are. Identify it. And run with it. Mechayel el chayel. And atzloch and everything, especially atzloch with the hamachas. Listening to the sichas. Learning the sichas. Hodaving in the sichas. Understanding them. Pilpaling zich in them writing them, transcribing them, editing them. And uh, from this, you're going to uh, build a tremendous reservoir of Havana and Yediya. And of course, your Shemayim and Avas Shemayim. And it should be with uh, tremendous Hatzlocha. And I thank you very much. And Bekar of Mamish, we should have that famous posik that the Rebbe would always quote from Yeshaya. <coughs> As Rashi writes in Shir Hashidim, the Rebbe would always quote that Melech HaMashiach would be, will be Megala. The ultimate Geshmak and depth and infinity of Torah. Teirah Seshel Mashiach, and a te'ime, a taste of Teirah Seshel Mashiach, came in the Teirah Sabal Shem Tev, the Talmidov, all the way down to the Rebbe, and have the moment that the Rambam says at the end of Hilchus Malachim, La yiye eise kol ha'olam kuli ala ladas es Hashem belvad, u lefichach yiye Yisrael chachamim g'doylim, v'yoidim dvarim astumim, V'yasigu das boyrim kifikoye cha'odom shenemar ki molar it's there so Hashem kamayim liyam mechasim and now I'm remembering the hadrin that Rebbe made Yer Aleph Nisan Tov Shem Mem Dalet on Tilcham Smesech the Tainus and on this Rambam I think it was almost two hours an hour and a half a very long hadrin a very hard hadrin <laughs> it was upside like a chover and at the end the Rebbe said the three madregas are connected Malchius Zichroinus Shoifris and the Rebbe said, of the Eilam, and therefore he's not going to explain what he means. And it was not a Geshmaka failing. The Rebbe said, Sarachmanas of the Eilam, that they had to hear such a long Hadrin. And the Rebbe, the Rebbe cut, it, cut off the Sikha with a Bracha. It was the end of the Rambam. He said, I have the Mullah Oritz Deyes Hashem. Kamayim Layam Mechasim. Bimheira Biyameinu Amen Va Amen. Take it from Yad Mamish. Zeit gesund. A gute Nacht. Amen. Yashakech, or Jacobson, Yashakech, sharing your memories, your experiences, and especially your chayas in the Nyanim, and for really giving us an appreciation of the schus and the yakras of being these manichim of the Rebbe's Torah and really connecting with the, with the Rebbe's Torah, the geschmack of the Rebbe's Torah. Shtaka bitzecha to be manichim of the Torah, chadosh me'iti teisei, teik me'ad mamash. Amen. We'll see who the manichim will be. So can sein that uh, Pinchas Reuses uh, the, in the middle of the Rebbe and the Mare, I don't know who's going to be the Manichim then, but if we can hear it, it's very good. Michael sein the Manichim, you can hear it, it's very good. As they say, as they say in English, to be a fly on the wall. Very good, very good. Yes, we care, God, grace and thank. Chazak. This class is brought to you by the yeshiva.net. Please help us continue the classes. Make even a small contribution at www.theyeshiva.net slash donate.